The skull of a Neanderthal woman discovered in 2018 by a team from the University of Cambridge in Shanador Cave has become the source of a new understanding for the world about Neanderthal life and also is a subject of a new Netflix documentary. Uh, today I'm here with Dr. Emma Pomore, the professor in archaeology at the University of Cambridge, where I would discuss this discovery with her. Thank you so much for being with me. Um, I would like to start by asking the timing of the project and everything about the timing because it's very historical discovery for us. Uh, when did the Kurdistan Regional Government extend the invitation to the archaeological team from the Cambridge University to come to Kurdistan? So I believe that it was in um, 2011 that the uh, Kurdish Regional Government first reached out to, in fact, Professor Graham Barker, who's the director of the project still, um, and colleagues from Liverpool John Moores University and from Birkbeck University of London. All right. And when exactly did the archaeological team from the Cambridge uh, arrive in Kurdistan and begin their uh, excavations? Excavations began in 2014. Um, it took a few years just to raise some funding to enable the project to, to start. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Emma, uh, the school has been there for more than 75,000 years. And uh, some people here ask that why did it take so long for the archaeologists to find it? And uh, exactly on which day and month of the year of 2018 we would like to know the exact day and month uh, that the skull, the skull of the Shanader Z was found in Shanader. Part of the reason it's taken so long to find her remains is a because Shanadar cave is so large um, and we've only excavated a small part of that uh, Colleagues back in uh, the 1950s also excavated in the cave, led by um, Ralph Selecki. But again, the extent of the excavations was relatively small. Um, and in addition, the remains were found about seven and a half meters from the surface mm -hmm. of the cave today. So it's very complicated, as you can imagine, to excavate down um, that deep. So it's taken some time. Uh, in the end, we were aware there were some Neanderthal remains uh, in this part of the cave in around 2016. We could see them in the wall of the excavation. Um, but what we usually do is excavate from above. So it took some time to actually um, make that safe. It, it's quite complicated uh, in the trench. So in fact, the excavations really took place in 2018. And I believe we first saw the skull on the 11th of September in 2018, but we were aware there are some other parts of the body there too, um, such as the ribs back in 2016. Mm -hmm. And how long did it take to put together the uh, pieces of the bone fragments of the Nandotol woman skull that you found? It was extremely challenging and it's mm -hmm. taken um, over nine months. I have to say a lot of the work was done by the amazing conservator we have working on the project, uh, Lucia Lopez Pauline. Um, but yes, she's worked for nine months on that, cleaning all the fragments and then sticking them back together. I've helped with some of that process too, but there is still more work to be done. So it's, a, it's an ongoing project. Mm -hmm. And where do you think the skull will be permanently located? Uh, will it be the United Kingdom or will it be brought back to Kurdistan? It will be brought back to Kurdistan. So very generously at the moment, it's on loan to us in the UK um, for the conservation process um, and the piecing of the fragments together. And that's a very generous loan from the General Director of Antiquities in Iraqi Kurdistan. But yes, it's very clear that this came from Iraqi Kurdistan and it will go back to Iraqi Kurdistan. And what scientific contributions do you think that uh, it does the discovery of Shandar Z add to our understanding of Neanderthal life in Kurdistan. The discovery of her skeleton really offers a wealth of opportunities to find out about Neanderthal life in this region. Um, she joins what is already 10 Neanderthal individuals that have been found in the cave back in the 1950s. Right. And we're very lucky now because we have a whole load of scientific techniques that weren't available then that we can apply to understand more about her life. So we're hoping to find out the kind of food she used to eat and um, whether she was born locally to um, the cave or whether she'd traveled the kind of activities she used to do sort of day to day as well we're also finding out things like how old she was when she died 
um, facts about her health so that we can see, for example, she had poor dental health in some respects. She'd lost some teeth before she died. Uh, and we can see that she has, for example, arthritis in her neck. So there's a huge amount we can learn about her. Mm -hmm. And apart from the discovery of Shana Derzet by your team and the previous discoveries of Ralph Suluki uh, at Shana Der, are there other areas of interest do you think there will be in Shana Der Cave for further research and discoveries to be made? Absolutely. I mean, Shanadar Cave is such a rich and important archaeological site. Um, it has layers that date back to over 100,000 years ago, but important archaeology from the whole of that period right through to very recently, uh, including the Neanderthal remains that we found, um, but also remains that come from some of the earliest farmers in the region. So, like I said, we've got an archaeological sequence that runs all through that time and it offers us really important opportunities to understand um, changes in the climate through time and how that affected the people using the cave. Also things like um, the transition between Neanderthal populations and the arrival of modern human populations. Mm -hmm. A really important question in archaeology is what was that transition like? Did modern humans right. just replace Neanderthals or was there much more kind of an overlap in when they were using the cave? So there's a huge amount for us to learn um, from Shandar Cave and it's such an important archaeological site. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you think that the Kurdistan regional government should have new projects to make more discoveries in Shandar Cave? Do you recommend that? So actually, um, at the moment, the project that I've been part of is still ongoing. Mm -hmm. So um, we have another um, permit to continue the project for another few years. And we're working very closely with the um, regional uh, director of antiquities um, and also the local director of antiquities in um, Saran province to continue investigations there at the moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, how long, according to your discoveries, of course, how long do you believe the life of the Neanderthal people continued in Kurdistan? So we're still um, doing more work to actually find out kind of more precisely when Neanderthals stopped living in this area of Kurdistan. Um, but it seems like probably they were there till about 45,000 years ago. Um, and then around that time were replaced by modern humans. Mm -hmm. And do you think the Neanderthal people stayed or lived longer in Kurdistan or in Croatia? It's very hard to say, actually. One of the challenges that we have is that the methods we have to tell um, how old some of the archaeology is, is not hugely precise um, at that period of time. And we know that Neanderthals were um, going extinct at roughly the safe same time, both in this region in Kurdistan, but also in um, Croatia. So probably it's very similar, although the limitations of the dating techniques that we have mm -hmm. make it very hard to say exactly where they, they lived um, somewhat longer. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Netflix documentary that we've seen, uh, your team suggests that the Shanadar cave may have been like a burial ground for the uh, Neanderthal people. That's how they used it. Do you think they just use it as a burial ground or they lived there and... Uh, had other living behaviours done there? Actually, the evidence that we have from the archaeology mm -hmm. shows that they were both um, burying their dead there, and Shanadar Zed is one of those individuals who was buried there. But we can also see that they were living there, absolutely. And they were actually living very, very close to the places where they were burying their dead. So we have very good evidence for things like small fireplaces being built, um, the waste from food, things like animal bones, but also small burnt bits of plant food. Uh, we can see some of their tools, their stone tools, um, and where they were making these and repairing these. And the areas where we can see this evidence of kind of everyday life is literally right next to where we find the skeletons. So they could have been sitting next to a fireplace and reached and just been able to touch where the skeletons were. So this makes for a really interesting question about that relationship between the living and the dead. I mean, clearly it doesn't seem that they were afraid to be so close to the dead, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, so absolutely, we have evidence of both life and of death at, um, at Shanadar Cave, which is what makes it so exciting, I think. Okay. 
And what do you think is the reason that um, Neanderthal people disappeared in Kurdistan, in Shanadar? What was the reason? Was it the, the clashes between the, um, them and the Homo sapiens, the new species, or there were other climate change causes? I mean, this is one of the massive debates that we have uh, in this academic field at the moment. And we know that actually at this time, when Neanderthals probably disappeared in Kurdistan, they were also disappearing in other parts of the world. Exactly why, we're not sure, but it does seem over time that Neanderthal populations across their range, which goes from sort of the Atlantic coast all the way across to Russia, were becoming quite vulnerable to extinction. They lived in relatively small groups. Um, they were having children with um, not close relatives, but they didn't have the kind of genetic diversity which really makes for healthy populations. Um, so it seems like actually their populations were already declining, becoming small um, and becoming less resilient to any change. In that context, it could be that some of the major climate fluctuations that we see but also perhaps the arrival of our own species, modern humans, um, contributed to them ultimately going extinct, mm -hmm. which is something they, that they were vulnerable to anyway. Uh, another question that may be running in all of our heads, uh, maybe we don't think of it as very scientifically as you do, but I would still have to ask it. How much Neanderthal DNA do, do you think modern humans have in us? So the evidence we have is pretty good that most populations um, alive in the world today have a percentage of Neanderthal DNA. Now, it's not a huge percentage. Mm -hmm. um, it varies across populations from perhaps one to three percent, slightly more in some populations. And it varies quite a lot between individuals as well. So it's only a relatively small amount, like I said, probably one to three percent. Um, but it is significant. And, and we have some evidence that it's related to health and some of our physical characteristics as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Emma Famori, Professor in Archaeology at the University of Cambridge, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being here with me today. Thank you very much for having me.